Welcome back, everybody. AMC short interest has in increased today even further than yesterday to 19%, which is fairly massive. The short interest value we're looking at here is $150 million on these self-reported short interest numbers. The days to cover has increased from yesterday to 3.33 days as well, and almost 50 million shares out of the approximately 320 million share float has been reported as short. As we saw the day before yesterday, there was seven, over 7.7 .7 million shares shorted that day, and the short interest was at 16.3% just the day before yesterday. And meanwhile, the stock remained green. Uh, however, people need to keep in mind that retail investors own 85% of the entire float, Exchange traded funds, another 5%. Insiders, approximately another 5%. Institutions, around 28.5%. And they're going net long. And we have no idea how many shorts are illegally marked as long. Not to mention rehypothecations, is the contracts, futures that are not reported on these because they're traded over the counter. Therefore, we do not get to see those short contracts. Not to mention as well, married and divorced puts oftentimes more often than not there are significant numbers of married and divorced puts which creates a synthetic long position which market makers and short hedge funds can use to hedge their position without actually owning shares of the stock so that is quite in quite a, a large number of synthetic longs that may not truly exist in the form of shares. Simply they are options contracts that are married together with the other side of the trade. What's going on everybody? Welcome to the stream. Thank you for joining us. We are getting right back in it today here. Today, even still, the short, incre the short interest estimates increased to over 19% today uh, from yesterday's approximately 17%. That's millions and millions of shares shorted. We started off the day at three dollars and five cents a share it ended the day barely red and in the end of the at the end of the day here in after hours we are at three dollars and three cents a share so there's an additional eight million dollars in short interest value compared to what we saw yesterday or more with a two cent difference in the stock price but taking into account all of the heavy shorting that's occurred today and yesterday and the day before we are looking at a decrease in the stock price over the last five days of 22% that is directly attributable to the shorts, increasing the short interest percentage of the free float from 12.5% last week to 19% this week. Some people may not understand even still why this is the case in, the, in which people are bullish on the stock when the stock price is going down. And I'll say this quite simply, increased short interest naturally takes the price of a stock down but it is not due to the fact that people are selling it is due to the fact that the stock price is being shorted the majority of people would not be here if they did not support support amc stock gamestop stock etc and the share price going down shows not that retail investors are selling but that large institutions are increasing their short positions Probably not because they want to, but at this point, because they have to. Because if they, if they were making so much money on these trades and shorting these stocks, they would cover their positions, take their profit, and move on to the next. But that's exactly the opposite of what's happening. Because as you can see, 272 institutions holding almost 76 million shares, 83.52% of them remaining on the buy side not as well as retail investors. There are over 3.8 million American retail investors in AMC stock alone. That does not include people in South America, Canada, Europe, Asia, etc. At the same time, we're looking at the volatility index showing some serious movements here to the, to the upside, especially this is over the last three days. This is April 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and today the 4th. We saw some incredibly high movements in the volatility index from around 2 p.m. today to the close of markets where it 
increased from $13.75 to around $16.35 at the high. Ended the day just shy of 16 as the S&P 500 extended further declines. This is in part due to the increase in crude oil prices. As you can see here, crude oil Brent increased. This is Eastern time. So this is one hour uh, lag here uh, instead of two because this one's central time. This is Eastern. You can see the price of crude oil uh, futures went from $88.60 a barrel to $90.89 a barrel, which is pretty significant for a small movement there as well. As the United States is now talking about allowing Ukraine to join NATO, this causes further issues with the S&P 500 in the possibility of seeing World War III. Because if they do join NATO, then NATO countries have to intervene even further into the catastrophe that has become the Ukraine money laundering operation for the Democratic Party. At the end of the day here, take a look at inflation, the one month percent change in CPI for all urban consumers seasonally adjusted and de-weighted to remove some of the impact of food, energy, and housing. Because as you know, if that was still in the calculations, these would be significantly higher and the Federal Reserve does not want that. As you can see, the increase from October 2023 to February of 2024 from 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. That is the opposite way of which inflation is supposed to be moving right now, hence why the Federal Reserve will likely be implementing zero rate cuts this year unless they absolutely destroy and break financial markets. And commercial real estate is not sufficient. What's happening now in commercial real estate uh, and even residential more, uh, real estate is pretty much out of their control. They've tried to buy back even more mortgage-backed securities and instead of decreasing their balance sheet, the Federal Reserve has increased their balance sheet uh, significantly, which means that they have been propping up the values of residential mortgage-backed securities. Meanwhile, commercial real estate is simply seeing a return to a more reasonable price. It is all in its own bubble. They are interconnected greatly through these derivatives held by large banks and countries around the world. Hence, when you look at inflation like this, it becomes clearly obvious that there is no way that the Federal Reserve can afford to cut rates because what does cutting rates do? It stimulates the economy. It gives everybody a green light to go risk on and makes it easier for banks to lend money. Therefore, it would cause a further increase in spending, both governmental and in the private sector. But that decreasing of rates and printing of money would lead to even higher inflation, which is the exact opposite of what they're currently going for. Therefore, I hate to say it, permabulls. I'm neither a permabull nor a perma bear, but I am a realist. Even though the market continues to trend upwards in the, the greater long run, this, this year has been pretty good for NVIDIA and some of the other top seven tech stocks in the, in the world. Uh, the reality of the fact is that if you look at the greater markets, they're in piss poor shape. So they're continuing their current movements for the time being. But you take a look a little bit deeper at the Federal Reserve SOFR rate, which stands for Secured Overnight Financing, a rate which has hit its highest levels since the September 2019 repo operations explosion of money market rates. But this time, there are significantly higher rates. The volume even for accounting for the transition to SOFR is just extremely significantly higher than what it should be. Uh, the Fed, honestly, has probably already broken something, and they just don't even realize it yet, which means we have not realized it yet. So let's expand upon this. On September 17th, 2019, the interest rates on overnight repo agreements, which are basically short-term loans between financial institutions, experienced a sudden and unexpected spike 
which exhibited significant volatility amid a large drop in reserves due to the corporate tax date and increases in net treasury influence. The Federal Reserve said that although some upward pressure on money market rates due to these seasonal factors was expected, the extent of the increase in both the level and volatility of rates in secured and unsecured markets was surprising. A measure of the interest rate on overnight repos in the U.S., the SOFR rate increased from 2.43% on September 16th to five and a quarter on September 17th. During the trading day, however, interest rates exploded to as high as 10%. This activity affected the interest rates on unsecured loans between banks and other institutions and the effective federal funds rate as well, which serves as a measure for such interest rate moves. My little ones over here playing with their toys, excuse me. But the activity prompted emergency intervention by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which had to inject $75 billion in liquidity into the repo markets on September 17th, which is shown here. The historical average for this is 2.02%. So there's $75 billion worth of money printing over the course of the week saved the reverse repurchase program and money market funds from complete collapse, basically, from an, an implosion, if you will. On September 19th, their FOMC committee lowered the interest paid on bank reserves, and these actions were ultimately successful. And by September 20th, rates had returned to a stable level. But as you can see here, they are now at 5.3% for the first percentile range and 5.51% for the 99th percentile, which is, yes, significantly lower than the spike to 9% on September 17th, but for an everyday rate is still quite significant. Did I mention that bond rates are also increasing significantly? Look at the yield curve right here. U.S. two-month and one-month bonds are the highest paying at the current moment. Meanwhile, meanwhile, everything from the thirty, from the three-year all the way to thirty years, are an absolutely terrible investment that can't even beat inflation, because the United States and financial institutions are well aware of the high potential for a recession and a long-term recession at that. So it's now more profitable to buy these short-term bonds due to the massive yield curve inversion that occurs during every recession. This one being the biggest we've ever experienced, but has not yet been labeled as such formally. A lot of you may not know this because this is brand new information, but the United States Treasury has begun yield curve control for the first time in as long as I can remember. Yield curve control in the form of U.S. Treasury buybacks by the United States government because central banks around the world are not buying them any further, any longer. Lastly, reverse repurchase operations, excess liquidity from these money market funds, also known as mutual funds, has collapsed from what was the high last year of $2.5 trillion to today's $438 billion a fraction of what we had last year in excess liquidity. This excess liquidity is used to buy up U.S. Treasuries. And because of the draining of the reverse repurchase program, the United States government, in order to prevent the bond yields from spiking and further becoming more inverted, proving to us all what we already know, that there is a massive recession underway, yield curve control allows them to buy back bonds to prevent these from becoming even more greatly inverted. Again, it's all a facade. It's all a show. It's the plunge protection team for the bond market. The last day of the first quarter this, of this year, March 28th, the reverse repurchase program was at $594 billion, which, in case you may not know, is an artificially inflated number because banks and institutions uh, use this to cook their books for the end of the quarter to balance the books. And they did that across 90 participants. 
Today, as you can see, there was only 438 billion, a massive decrease of somewhere in the range of what, around $140 billion. Not to mention, instead of 90 participants, there was only 66. This is from a couple days ago, this is from yesterday, so the numbers have changed ever so slightly. The RRP is down $10 billion from yesterday alone, and from 73 participants to 66. So long story short, the overnight interest rate has increased quite a lot. So for this week alone, indicating that banks and institutions and money market funds expect that the Federal Reserve will have to raise interest rates even further or at least keep them higher for longer without cutting rates this year uh, to combat the recent rise in inflation, which I just showed you guys is occurring as well here. Or money markets are now broken and we'll see another meteoric rise in these interest rates, which will force the Federal Reserve to further inject liquidity via money printing, via bailouts, etc., causing even greater upwards pressure on this inflation. So the less money available in these money market funds through the reverse repurchase operations and, and in general for the excess liquidity, the less liquidity that there is available to buy the United States Treasury issuances, which is going to cause bond rates to rise and yield curve inversions to further invert as well as treasury bills to go what we call no bid. And this is when no institution or government bids on the auction. This forces people, the government I should say, this forces the government to do treasury buybacks. We are turning into the country of Japan where the, to the point where the United States eventually in the, in the near term future at this rate is going to own more of our own treasury bills than any other, than all other countries and central governments combined. This is basically showing extreme weakness in the future of the economy of the United States and the rest of the world as well. And to be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, the show is just getting started. So buckle up because we are going for a ride. And if you'd like more information on this, in the future, follow me at Boss Blunts one on Twitter, at LitExchange LLC on Twitter, or www.LitExchange.com as we bring you the world's first and only stock and crypto brokerage firm owned by retail investors, created for retail investors. That being said, I'm not fucking leaving. Ken Griffin, Susquehanna, State Street, Jane Street, Virtue and Company, Melvin and Company, Tiger Capital, I'm not leaving. I wish you all peace and wealth. Have a great day, my friends.